Hey you guys, it's your host Julian. This week I sit down with art director for Zootopia and production designer on Netflix's The Sea Beast, Mr. Matthias Lechner. We talk a lot about The Sea Beast, so if you haven't seen this movie, one, shame on you, but two, get on it. It's on Netflix. It is a fantastic movie. We also talk about him growing up in Germany and finding animation, we talk a little bit about imposter syndrome, and so much more. This chat does get a little deep at times, but it was one of those chats where you sit back and you really think, damn, we did it. We cover a lot of ground. I hope you enjoy this, and if you are digging it, leave us a rating, leave us a review, and tell a friend or two. Enjoy the show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to What's in My Head podcast. I'm your host, Julian, and today I'm joined by Mr. Matthias. Matthias, how are you, sir? Hey, Julian. I'm good. How are you? Ah, fantastic, man. Thanks for doing this. You know, so we did a little chatting beforehand, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, one of the movies that Matthias here worked on, which my family and I loved, I told you that before we started, uh, was Sea Beast. Man, the movie was so fun. Getting to see it on Netflix, it felt uh, whimsical. I felt like, a, I don't say I felt like a little kid in a sense where I was just like, oh, this amazement, but it was beautiful. It was bright. It was different. You know, the story, sometimes when you watch something, whether it's animation, a TV show, a movie, whatever it is, you think you know where it's going, right? You think you've got, oh, I can map this out. And then about halfway through the movie, I'm like, I don't know where this one's going as far as like, I thought I had the ending mapped out. And that's what I mean by, you know, where it's going. And I was like, okay, this is what they're going to do. And then you get 20 minutes into it. I'm like, oh shit, I'm wrong again. I got to imagine, man, this one was a lot of fun for you to work on. And we'll talk about some of the other projects you worked on too. But yeah. uh, how does Sea Beast from Netflix come about? How do you get the call? Um, well, I was actually working on um, Encanto at the time. Uh, and, and Chris William just had left Disney. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of kept him on my radar, see what he's doing. And then there was like, everybody's going to Netflix. Let's see what Netflix is doing. You know, that was like the, the big game in town. And I was, I was really curious. And so um, they had like this Christmas party. Um, I went there and then Chris cornered me <laughs> and, and told me the story that he had like planned to tell for a long time. And it was really like a passion project that seemed so, you know, it's 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 uh, something that he wanted to do like since childhood, it seems like it, you know, like a, a pirate story and an action movie and something with like real peril and all that stuff. And that really sounded interesting. And then it was like a really hard decision for me to um, like it was I was uh, was going to be art director on Encanto. That was my third movie for Disney art directing. And for Netflix, I would be production designer on that movie. So it was sort of like a career step up, but it was also just something new. And, you know, Chris called it, you know, like sailing into the unknown, you know, like when we arrived there, it was um, it was, you know, we were like a. a like the sound stage like they didn't really have a studio you know so we were it was all new we were the first people really starting to make a movie there and it was just exciting and I wanted to try that out and um it was great Chris you know Chris made it easier if it wasn't for a director I already knew and appreciated I might have not done the jump but because of that I kind of trusted him and he trusted me um yeah, and then uh, the movie. I can I can I talk a whole lot about the movie, but uh, I would say like a third in pandemic hit, and then um, that was like my what I did in the pandemic was the Sea Beast, and that was that was a nice thing to do <laughs> while you're waiting to get back out. Oh, I can imagine, man, and it's it's crazy. Obviously, Disney is a powerhouse, right? I mean, they're putting out hit after hit. I don't I don't give, really give a shit what anybody else says, man. Like, there's Disney, in my opinion, just doesn't miss. Like, you can find something good in almost every movie that they've done, whether you like the characters or you don't. I mean, if, if it's eliciting some kind of feeling, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, I feel like it's, it's what they're supposed to do. You know, it's not everything is supposed to be fun. Not everything is supposed to be, you know, magical or whimsical or anything like that. It's just it's supposed to elicit a feeling from you. You should hate a character if it's a villain, you know, sometimes. But if you can feel for the character... It's interesting, too, because you, you see that villain, you're like, oh, shit, I'm one bad day away from being that guy. I could have been him in the right or wrong circumstances, depending on how you look at it. Um, but going to Encanto for just a second, mm -hmm. I'm going to be real honest. Um, I did not like the movie at, at the beginning, right? I, it, because it was just the song, the Bruno song. It's still, <laughs> it's still, it's still, it is one of those things that is just here. 
right? It's like all I want for you from Christmas is from Mariah Carey that everybody just, it's a great song at first. And then when you've heard it 17 times through the Christmas, you're like, I hate this yeah. song, please you know first at first of the year come please so the song will go away that's what it was like with bruno or not bruno excuse me um but uh encanto yeah. and then i start and i watch it with my family and i'm like holy shit this is good right how far into production did you go over to see these with chris and how far were you in encanto is what i meant um i was i jumped off the last moment possible without hurting the production so yeah. which was basically just at the end of pre-production okay. um so i i was looking forward to encanto for a while because um it was the same team um byron howard and uh and jared i'll think of his name in a second um who the two director um who who did zootopia and and they're just a lot of fun they're very sensitive and and interesting and awesome to work with like the nicest people you can imagine um and they, I, I don't know, like when, when I, I, you know, you can tell that a movie is sort of like not, not a winner, but a special thing. Yeah. Uh, I had that on Encanto and I had that on Zootopia and I had it on the Sea Beast, thankfully. So, you know, it doesn't happen that often. But um, so I had a really good feeling about Encanto. There wasn't any music at that point. Um, so I did just some illustrations of the, the, the casa, the house, you know, and the environment. Um, I was supposed to gonna be art director for environments uh, when production went ahead, and so um, yeah, I mean, I would have also gladly stayed, but uh, I just you know wanted to try out something new. <laughs> yeah, Chris cornered you, man. It's all right. He pressed. But, uh, I, I love the movie. I liked it, and it's. I mean, the thing with Disney is there's so many good people, and mm -hmm. they have this um, strategy down where they just iterate until it's good, you know, and everybody at every stage makes it better. And so in a way, I, I, I'd be curious to know what a Disney movie would like look like if you don't art direct it, because I think it'll still probably be pretty good, you know, like because yeah. there's just great artists at every at every junction. There truly is, man. And, and like I said, at first I didn't like the movie. And then I, my my youngest son, our youngest son, because we had a we had a we have a one year old now um, as well. And uh one thing he absolutely loved. And I'm glad you brought up the the music with uh, Lin Manuel Lin Manuel Miranda. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. So I, you want to talk about a beautiful soul when it comes to music. I mean, his what he can do with music is, in my opinion, second to none. I mean, he is. There's no words I can put in a, a genius. I mean, it, that, that doesn't even seem like it's the right word. It just doesn't seem like it's strong enough for for what he does. Um, but it's it's funny because. Uh, we have the little Alexa machine downstairs, and usually when we eat, uh, when we eat dinner, we eat breakfast. Um, you know, he's starting. Cooper's starting to learn a couple words, but he knows where Alexa's at. So he he goes, you know, he points, you know, like that, and he goes, ah, and, you know, he's trying to say Alexa. And then so Disney favorites are generally what we listen to in the morning, and they play pretty much entirely in Canto, and uh, the Surface Pressure song comes on. So it's the one with uh, mm -hmm. Louis. She sings it. And that that song hits so deep. But you just listen to the lyrics. You're like, oh my god, it's catchy. It's melodic. But there's so much going on with the lyrics. Like it it like it hits you really hard. And you're like, holy shit, I'm I'm loving this movie because of the music. And that's what pulled me in. Because at that point in time, I hadn't seen the movie yet, and it really took the yeah. soundtrack here in the soundtrack. And then my wife's like, no, 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 you gotta watch, you gotta watch. I'm like, I don't want to hear anything about Bruno. I'm so tired about Bruno right now. She's like, no, 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 just shut up sit down and watch it and I watched it. I'm so glad I did because it's, it's such a beautiful movie. Um, yeah. Music is, uh, is, is, is really important. I've actually never, because I didn't work in Encanto, I've actually never worked in a musical, mm. but like what got me into animation is the jungle book. And, and, you know, the music on that is like, you know, <laughs> it's amazing. Matthias, can we be best friends? Because the jungle book is my favorite Disney movie of all time. Nobody. Yeah, I would, I would say that too. Yeah. It's, it's, and and I always say it's my favorite. Like Blue is is the in my opinion the greatest Disney character, the greatest Disney hero. Right? He's he's just my guy. I, there's something about that character that I absolutely love. And uh, last year, it was either last year or earlier this year, I got to talk to Floyd Norman. Right? I'm pretty sure you know who Floyd Norman is working at Disney. I mean, he's a Disney legend, but he also got to work on the Jungle Book. So he got to tell him tell these these amazing stories. And unfortunately, you know, I had a two hour conversation with him, and then 
uh, I only got 30 minutes because some stuff happened with the uh, rendering and everything like that. So I lost, you know, almost 90 minutes worth of the, the chat. Um, but getting to hear him talk about animating and writing and doing all of this stuff for Jungle Book was absolutely amazing. Um, but but yeah, the Jungle Book is, is so beautiful. Yeah, and I saw that as a kid when I, um, I think it was the 10 year release. So it must have been 77. I was seven years old. And um, my parents had to drive me to the cinema in town because we lived like in a small town in rural Germany. And they didn't understand that they had, that I, I needed to see it again. You know, like back yeah. then you had to go back to the cinema and watch it again. And I had to convince them. And it really kind of set off a bug in my head. You know, like I tried to figure out how animation is done. And I, I built like this shoe box and I knew you have to put lots of images. And then like I tried to pull some some images through that shoebox that didn't work you know? <laughs> and then eventually I, I figured out how to do animation That's um so cool but the jungle book was really the the thing that that made me think i i want to be part of that world i never thought i would be part of disney you know like when you're when you're growing up in germany in the 70s you don't think that that that's a possibility even um i'm so, I'm, so yeah. oh, go ahead. I'm sorry go ahead, go ahead. Um, yeah, so so that was never the plan to to actually go there, um, but but I knew I wanted to be in animation. And then when I finished school, um, I worked in a hospital for a short time, and then uh, there was like pretty much the first German feature animation movie uh, produced just mm -hmm. just at that time, and then so I was uh, I got to be part of that studio, and and that's how it started. <laughs> That's really cool. I'm so glad you brought it up because uh, like I told you before, I think you were the first um, and there's no thinking you are the first person that I've actually had on from Germany um, that works in animation. And what I absolutely love is we, we had a little chat about this before, but it's the crossing of barriers. Right. So going from America where this movie is made, it gets flooded out to the rest of the world and everybody else is seeing it. I would love to know, like, was the Jungle Book your first movie? How did animation, how did America, oh, I hit this microphone, sorry. How did American animation for you, how did that come into your life in Germany? I would love to know that story. Was the Jungle Book the first one you saw? That was the first one I saw in the cinema, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there, there was like, you know, um, like sort of like a Disney TV thing on, uh, weekly um, on TV. Mm -hmm. I watched, uh, you know, um, Looney Tunes, that sort of thing was there too. Um, then there was like also we had some some animation from from uh, Poland, for example, or from Czechoslovakia, which was really cool, cool and different. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know that that for me Disney was the thing, you know, like the yeah. uh, just the basically um, once they started uh, uh, to Xerox the animation drawings, that style, you know, from um, I guess it's the Dalmatians maybe or or. That's you know, where it started, yeah. Yeah, where you can see the, the rough of the animator. That was just, uh, I just, I love that style so much. I really do. And then um, you might, um, oh, for the life of me, I can't remember his name now. Um, is it Hans? Shit. I can't remember his last name. Um, but he is, he's worked at Disney and he, what's that? Hans Bacher? I, I believe so, but he posts, um, fuck. It's his Instagram handle is like one more time or something like that or one, mm -hmm. one more time, something along those lines. But um, he's posting consistently like old school Disney art, uh, you know, photos of like Ken Anderson and, and all these folks that worked on it. And then the style and I was, you know, conversing with him through Instagram and he was telling me like, you know, you check this person out, look at this, you know, write this down, you know, research this. He's showing all this pre-production art, production art from Dalmatians to Mulan to, you know, whatever it is, Aristocats, okay. you know, so getting to see, getting to look at 101 Dalmatians and then getting to see, like, take a peek behind the curtain. And like you just said, you get to see those rough pencils, right? You're watching the animation go and you're like, oh shit, I, I saw, I saw that. And it just, it's something, and it's not like I hate on current animation, right? I, right. I love current animation, but there's something very, very special, it, it, something intimate. I don't know if that's the right word. There's something intimate about seeing something that you knew Ollie or Frank drew or, yeah. you know, Mark Davis, he did Cruella. You see his pencils. It's just something special about getting to see where somebody had, maybe they hit too hard on their pencil tip or they went too easy on the paint. Right. Just, you can see the little mistakes and stuff. Yeah. Yes. And yes. I don't know for me that 2d animation, um, I, I, I feel the same, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm, 
you know, I'm fine with the 3D world, you know. Mm -hmm. But originally, the it was that magic of this is actually man-made. Yeah. Uh, uh, this whole thing is is somehow they they created this magic mm -hmm. just from a pencil, basically. You know, yes. um, that that really impressed me as a child. It still impresses me, and um, it's not the same in 3D. In 3D, we just tinker and tinker and build and build. It's maybe a little bit more like like a claymation in some way because it feels like we're having puppets, yeah. you know, um, or or actually like real light and all that stuff. So it's a it's a different game and it's fun too in its own way, yeah. but, but it's not the same magic. Absolutely, man. And I, I'm hoping one day. And and I've had this talk with so many folks. Um, I mean, I've, I've been doing this for, for over two years now, um, but just getting to hear like how folks got into animation, like what was that initial spark or that initial uh, wonderment, excitement, you know, getting to see the jungle book, like you were saying, I had to go back and watch it. And then I tried to make animation move with this little box. It's, it's just, it's interesting to see what people's inlets was to whatever it is they love, whether it's sports, right. whether it's food, whether it's animation, you know, and then seeing where they take it and how far they take it. And like I said, just knowing that you're in a different country, halfway around the world, man, you're, you guys are absorbing the same stuff we are and you're, you're getting something different from it. Now with the movies and stuff, I got to imagine that you guys probably had, uh, you know, German dubbing over it, but did you, yeah. when you, okay. So jungle book, you, you heard in your native. That's jungle book, yeah. yeah? <laughs> That's awesome, man. Uh, when was the, the, the Disney dubbing was always pretty good. Like even was it? Uh, yeah. I mean, German dubbing generally is okay because it's quite an industry. Mm -hmm. uh, but Disney specifically, you know, like um, with, when there's a children's voice, it was also a children's voice um, yeah. speaking in the German accent and uh, the German voice. And they did, they did pretty well. They still do pretty well, actually, with the songs and everything. Do you remember the first movie or as far as animation goes that you might have seen and uh, it wasn't dubbed over in German? It might have been in English. Do you remember? Um, yeah, that would have been later when I already started working in animation. Like uh, when I grew up, there was nothing in English, so yeah. it was all dubbed. And um, it might have been a, a part of the how uh, was that Richard Williams movie um, that he took twenty seven years to to create. Um, oh, I'm no help on this one. Um, no, I'm sorry. Um, look it up, uh, Richard Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back. Yeah. And we're back. Matthias had to help me out with that one. So The Thief and the Cobbler is what Matthias there found. That's right. And um, that is a movie that uh, Richard Williams was working on for so many years. And there were some people in the German studio uh, I was working on called Trick Company. And there was a lot of uh, English people, Irish people, and they part of them have had worked on it and they so so in the industry before the movie came out long time before everybody kind of looked at the reels and and you know like so that's that might have been the first one i've seen in original um and it's an amazing movie and uh, eventually i think warner brothers bought it and added some songs and kind of killed it somewhat and <laughs> and released it but uh, it's still worth i mean there's some sequences in there they're just unbelievable uh what, what you can do with 2d like a chase sequence over checkerboards which is just crazy um i can only recommend it if you see it, the thief and the cobbler somewhere um even if it's the warner brothers release it's still worth watching okay i'm gonna see if i can find both of them and then i'll compare notes um when if you don't mind me asking when did you come over to the states um so i uh i traveled around a lot in the beginning because uh there wasn't that much work in germany so i had to go uh, i lived in canada for a while and then moved back to Germany and then I lived in Denmark for four years um, and then at some point I had lived in Canada and Denmark and I really wanted to go back to Germany um, and uh, the first thing that German company did that I that I went to said uh, you want to go to Montreal <laughs> and so it's like oh, okay I can do that for four months or so and that's where I met my wife she's Canadian um, and she moved over with me to Germany for a couple of years and then we moved to Canada and then in, that was like my my break into North America. I worked on a couple of Canadian, there wasn't much, I was in Vancouver. So I got all the two animation movies that were produced in Vancouver at the time, which was uh, Space Chimps, which don't Google it. 
and uh, which was my first 3D movie. So I, I not only did I learn, you know, the process in this movie, but I also actually met a lot of really cool people that I'm still friends with. Yeah. Um, so that's the good thing about it. Um, the second one was Escape from Planet Earth. And then uh, one one guy that worked with me on Space Chimps knew the production designer, Dave Getz, at, at Disney um, and put us in contact. And um, and we we talked for quite a few years. Um, and then eventually after Escape from Planet Earth, the um, it worked out. And he said, I got this movie called Savage City. You want to, you know, just maybe like have three months contract, uh, do some development work. And I did, and I was uh, sweating every day, and you know, trying to figure out what what the Disney guys want that I that they don't have, you know. <laughs> like, um, and then they pro prolonged it again, three months and three months again, and uh, Savage City changed into uh, Zootopia, and um, and then eventually they asked me in 2014 if I want to be art director on it, because I seem to have a vision for the world, and um, I said yes. So then we moved over and that was it. What was that moment like? Did it feel yeah. real? Did it feel like, like, is this a joke? What did it feel like when they said, hey, do you want to be art director for this movie? Um, I, I felt honored for that. Um, I, I have a photo of um, me holding an iPad with an email on it <laughs> and, uh, and my wife. And we were like in the morning drinking coffee and it's like, ah, this is happening, you know. Um, but it was such a long buildup. Um, like I said, it was probably uh, like at least a year and a half, maybe even two years. I worked on the movie at home, mm -hmm. so I I got a I I started to understand that they like what I'm doing with it, and so it wasn't. I didn't think it was a joke, but uh, I was I was very excited about it. Yeah, that's really cool. Now with something like I I I know you you just said it, but uh, like how far from Vancouver to Disney? Like how long did that take? Like a couple years, you said. Um, I was ten years in Vancouver. Ten years uh, in Vancouver, and then that's when you yeah. came over to Disney. Right, and then now we're eight years here. Okay, and when you come over to Disney, something that I found out when I talked. Um, uh, shit, my name. I'm blanking on his name now. I'll come back to it. Um, Sandra Cluzo. God, I don't know why I blanked on his name because I see his face. I see a smiling face. I'm like, oh, I'm going to remember his name and then I forget it. Um, but I had Sandra Cluzo on not too long ago. Um, and he's from Brazil. And mm -hmm. he, I, I asked him one question because I absolutely love it. Uh, you know, getting to see the behind the scenes documentaries on, on what Walt, or not Walt Disney, but Disney, the Disney World, the Disney World experience, and getting to go to the theme parks. So I live here in Orlando, Florida. So getting to go to the theme parks, one thing I love seeing is I love seeing people's name tags. And then I love seeing the country they're from or if they're in if they're from my state in florida it'll say like oh from orlando or you know it'll say tallahassee or cal or something like that so I always like seeing where people come from um because for a little while i was in the navy um and i got to go all over the world i got to see a whole bunch of different cool things some cool some bad you know nothing too crazy but it was just like i got to experience traveling and then before i joined the navy and before i turned 18 i actually got to go over to italy for the first time not by myself, but with my um, my language, the the language um, classes that I had taken through high school. I took four years of Italian. Um, I took four years of Italian so I didn't have to watch The Godfather in subtitles. I wanted to be able to listen to what they said and not have to read, right? So that's why I took Italian for four years. Sure. So I go to Italy and it's a complete culture shock. Like I'm like, I'm sitting here, I'm 17 years old. I'm walking around by myself because we go over to this country and we're just experiencing everything. I got to see the, the Sistine Chapel. I got to see the statue of David. I got to see all of this beautiful art. I got to see all these beautiful people. I got to eat all this beautiful food, right? So it was just this crazy experience. So whenever I get to talk to somebody that's from a different country, I love hearing how they can come here. They, I mean, is the English pretty good as far as like, do they teach you guys English over in Germany? Like when you're going through school? I did have 13 years of English and five years of French in school. Um, and so far when I started mind. working in animation, everybody speaks English. Yeah. That's like just a common language because people are from different countries. Mm -hmm. So it's already kind of animation is international in other places too. So yeah. um, so I spoke English uh, since I'm like, I don't know, 20. Oh, um, and I'm thinking English, you know, it's just second nature now at this point. That That's so cool because it's one thing that I think 
this country is so far behind. Like it would broaden so many people's horizons. It would open up. It would really show people that, you know, regardless of what country you're from, what country I'm from, we're the fucking same at the end of the day, man. You put your leg, you're you're not, you don't put your legs on one pan at a time. You put your pants on one leg at a time, right? You eat dinner, you go to sleep, you do this, you do that. I do that too, right? So I, I really feel like we're so far behind in the school systems and this is not to get on, get off topic or anything, but it's something special about when somebody that can come from a different country and can communicate with us. And then I go to their country and I've always, whenever I go somewhere, I always have like a little book. Right. And then I try my best because I, I don't want to. I'm, I'm not actually, people. I'm not very good at languages, to be honest. No, um, it's, it's just that it's been such a long time. And uh, I did try, I was living, like I said, a, a four years in Denmark and I tried my best, but yeah not very good <laughs> hey, but you tried and that's what a lot of people don't do a lot of people don't want to look dumb they don't want to look like they don't know what they're doing so it's interesting a lot of isn't that... it yeah like looking dumb is interesting because it's uh <laughs> what you have to, in some way it sounds dumb to you but you kind of have to kind of like imitate the people and the way they act and think you know and that that takes some people like it's you have to want to assimilate basically so yes. if you don't do that you're not going to really learn it like Absolutely. There, there's something about full, um, full immersion, right? Just yeah. going in, lowing the culture, looking at things. And like I said, people just, I don't, I don't know what it is, man. It's just people don't want to look like, they don't want to look bad. So I, I see a lot of people, you know, so getting to travel with the Navy, I got to see a lot of people and a lot of those arrogant Americans that I would, I would, <laughs> I would go out with and shit. They wouldn't want to speak the language of the, of the, the natives. They wouldn't want to go and try native food. They just want to go wherever they were at. They want to go and eat McDonald's. They want to go and eat Burger King. I was like, dude, come on, man. We can get this shit in the States. Let's go. But I'm a foodie. I love food. There's not been one fucking thing that I, I just don't love eating. Um, but the only reason I asked all of that and all of that word vomit thrown out there to, to, to talk about language was when you come over to Disney, obviously you, you said you had 13 years of experience when it came to speaking English. But when somebody from a different country comes over into a big company like Walt Disney, do they try to pair you guys up with people that are from maybe the same area, might speak the same language, so it feels not so much like home, but it's easier? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, but there's a lot of, it's like, it's relatively international. Mm -hmm. Like there, there was maybe two, three other Germans there. Mm -hmm. um, and I, for some reason, I always end, end up hanging out with the, um, like a lot of Spanish and French. Um, it's the, 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 the expats are tend to hang out together and then yeah. go for small breaks in, in the back, you know? <laughs> um, and so that's where you meet the people that you want to hang out with. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, and I stopped smoking now and don't smoke kids, you know, <laughs> it's not good for you. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, you know, it was, there was some, some cultural things like, um, and I, it's funny, I see them like some, some Spanish friends that came later to Disney had the same problem. Um, like in Germany, the director would tell me straight away what's wrong, you know, like this, okay, so wouldn't would look at the picture and say yeah but this has to be that and, and so on so you get the a download of the information straight away that does not happen with american directors it's yeah. great it's fantastic you're really lucky if they tell you something that it, I, it was really hard to work remote with them and figure out what's the part they didn't like that much yeah because they just wouldn't say it it would just all be positive and and so now i kind of have a feeling for you know, like if I get an inkling of something that a hesitation and an up, they don't like that, you know, yeah. but, but uh, Americans are very positive about feedback all the time, um, which you got to get used to. And I mean, there's just, the, the positivity comes in other ways too. Like, for example, when I was work, I studied in Ireland and I was in England for a while and, um, you know, everybody slags each other off, you know, it's like, there's no way you can say something nice about another person. That's not how you show affection, you know, yeah. and it's so nice in America that you can actually compliment other people and tell good things to other people. And it's not cheesy. It's just normal. You know, it's like, that's, a, that's one thing I really like about being here. Well, I'm glad, man. I'm glad something good came out of it, man, because there's a lot of negative shit out there in the world. I'm so glad that there's still positivity out there, because that's what's, that's what's fun about this podcast, man. It's getting to show 
the positive light to what you guys do. Like I told you before we hit record, man, this is a love letter to you guys. Cause you guys, you know, whether it's Zootopia, whether it's Encanto, you know, whether it's CVs, whether, whatever, whatever it is, you know, you guys are trying your damnedest to put out something amazing. You know, sometimes it hits, sometimes it doesn't. But one thing that's always a constant is you guys work diligently. You guys work so damn hard to put out the best movie you can. And we appreciate that. I know I do. And I know there's so many other fans that really appreciate what you guys do. Um, but switching it back, and I apologize for going off on that tangent, but whenever I can talk okay. to somebody from a different country, I just love hearing and seeing how you guys, you know, absorbed or, you know, how you guys got to to, to liken the stuff that came from here. I, I just think yeah. it's fascinating. Um, but going back to CBs for just a few, and like I said, we'll probably jump all over the place because that's why it's called What's Up? Jump ahead, jump ahead. Yeah, you know, uh, but going back to the CBs, man, uh, when this movie, slash forward ahead a little bit, so when the movie drops, right, mm -hmm. what were you guys expecting? Like, what was, what's that feeling like when your movie, obviously going to a theater is one thing, but Netflix, at 7 o'clock p.m. PST, what we'll say, right, mm -hmm. it drops, it is open to millions of viewers at once what is that feeling like knowing that it's out there for everybody to see right now um it's well it's it's my first time so it wasn't quite as exciting as when a disney movie drops yeah um, because there's a lot of you know anticipation and drums being beat before mm -hmm. the movie comes out and there's hardcore fans that comes into the cinema that was before pandemic um and and then you get the numbers and it's a good weekend or not a good weekend and hopefully it's a hit and all that stuff in netflix um they didn't there was not much advertising for the movie yes so um everybody i knew and had worked on the movie and everybody i could engage was like put it out on social media talk about it put it on you know like so i've never really push the movie on social media but this one i tried as much as possible because you have to get on the top 10 Mm -hmm. you know then people start seeing it and i i was pretty convinced if people see it they're probably gonna like it because you know i i like it so yeah. um, you kind of hope you know yeah. um so uh what was exciting was um seeing it in the cinema like we had like i said we did it in the pandemic so um the screen i was working on was like like i'm looking at you right now it's a computer screen and we only had like a couple of times where we quick check checked in the cinema if it if it kind of checks out a couple of sequences, but to see the whole thing in the cinema for the first time was amazing, and that was an Annecy, and so you have this I don't know how many people were there like nine hundred animation nerds in one cinema <laughs> and you show your movie for the first time. Oh sorry. Oh you're fine. Uh, you sh sorry. Oh yeah. Uh, you so you you show your movie to that crowd and they're they're excited that that was like the best because um yeah i mean i i mean we did make the movie on a little screen and it is made for tv in some way because it's netflix but um but it's we also try to make we all want to make cinema movies really you know so yeah sorry well there we go do you, do you hear that sound over there? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. My hearing. Okay, my my hearing is really bad, anyway. That was my phone ringing. It's probably filtered out. So sorry about that little uh, no, gap it's, here. It's perfect. Um, yeah. So and then later on, the numbers come in. It's really hard to say uh, what's the success. Like, and I know it in in ticket sales. You know, like Topia hit a billion. That was amazing. You know. Yeah. But in Netflix, so I think that the numbers we. We got just like a, a couple of weeks ago was that it was watched 165 million Holy hours shit. Um, in the first 28 days, which is <laughs> the most insane. successful animation movie that Netflix made so far. So they're happy. You guys uh, got to be happy, too. What does that feel like? Uh, well, I actually calculated what that's in years. That's like nearly 19,000 years. That's Holy insane. shit. <laughs> like what <laughs> that is insane uh, yeah so so it's uh i don't know it's like what's gonna it's interesting to um uh, like i saw I, I got a lot of feedback i um i i watched the the stuff coming into in, on twitter and so on what people liked it's always really interesting it's like a learning uh opportunity for me to, oh, to yeah. what landed and what didn't 
Um, but what's exciting is then years later when you meet somebody um, that, you know, like uh, studied animation at the time. And, you know, like I had one moment with Zootopia where I was um, on some thing in China and a little boy came up to me and, and the translator told him I was working Zootopia and he was like, yeah, I love that movie. That's the that's the amazing thing when you then meet some, meet somebody that's so remote and so somewhere else in I don't know Russia or wherever you know having watched that movie and liked it that that's the awesome part like the numbers you know what they are the abstract really absolutely man and that, that's really nineteen thousand and then that's like you know me back then watching the Jungle Book <laughs> it absolutely is you can see yourself in that little yeah. kid that comes up exactly. to you say, i loved what you did in zootopia you can see yourself like oh shit is that what i looked like when i got the bug for animation right. you know that, that's that's something really special and, and and thank you for sharing but, i really like hearing that but it's a it's a crazy reach that you have there um another thing that that was interesting is that uh in, I'm, I'm used to really being very nitpicky about the colors and 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 every little pixel Mm -hmm. um and at netflix we were told we were still nitpicky we still did you know the best we could do but they said you know like every tv has a different setting um you can't really control what the movie is going to look like when people watch it like it's going to look like this on the iphone and like that with you know uh, people like tvs can only really separate them to each other from you know being more colorful or more contrasty or something like that so they crank it up and you have no control. <laughs> Which so is a little weird. When I want to circle back to, to something, because I always think this is a really cool, really cool moment. Because <clears throat> whenever you guys are making something, you guys are go, 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 head down, trying to build a world, trying to build a movie. You guys got deadlines, schedule. You know, a lot of times people are behind or they might be ahead, but then they go quickly behind really quick just by one little issue, you know. But one thing that I absolutely love is when you get to experience something that you guys worked years on with a live audience, right? Mm -hmm. So obviously this is after, was you, you said you got to screen it in Annecy uh, yeah. post-pandemic, right? This year, yeah. Okay, cool. So obviously everybody's emotions, everybody's, everybody's hyped up because they had just spent two years during a lockdown. They, you know, right. everybody is se segregated, essentially. Everybody is isolated. Mm -hmm. So now it's opened up and then everybody's back out. So I got to imagine the energy already was pretty raucous. It was pretty crazy. You know, everybody was pumped to go out and do something with other people. What was it like for you sitting in that crowd, just watching people watch what you helped bring to life? What was that like? It's a good feeling. Yeah. <laughs> what can I tell you? It's like... Uh, um. It's, um, I, I mean, you know, I kind of like a lot of the time people are quiet, which is a good thing too, you know, like uh, it's, our movie is not, not super gag driven, you know, there's a couple of jumps and so on. Uh, what's really awesome is what people like put on Twitter afterwards. That's, yeah. that's where, where <laughs> like, because in the cinema, I just want them to absorb it and enjoy it and, and so on, you know. Um, I remember uh, Chris, he, you know, he he wasn't sure if he wanted to watch the movie with the crowd, and then eventually he decided yes, he did. But then he was sitting like way in the back somewhere, and when the movie was over, uh, one of the uh, um, you know the guards that do, you know checks the tickets and so on uh, was standing behind him and said "magnifique," and that was like the best moment for Chris. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it's like little things like that, or you know, it's it's just. Um, yeah, people. When when people notice something specific, for example, uh, in in this movie, we made sure that the cast is really diverse, and we spend a lot of time taking um, skin color and hair texture and all that stuff really seriously. Um, and then there's a, like a lot of uh, you know tweets of you know young African American girls saying, you know, I finally saw myself in the film, and thank you so much for doing that. And that's that stuff's really awesome. Yeah, that's really cool, man. Um, during this, during this, uh, I, I want to stick on this this topic for just a second. But during this whole ordeal, do you guys get to do a Q and A after the movie after it's finished, or is it just showing and then you guys had to leave? Um, this one, well, there was like a separate uh, making off panel. Okay. So I have done the like we I have like a a nine minute a 
12 minute and a 24 minute uh making off section mm -hmm. that i can present you know yeah and uh and it's been like we were just at lightbox we're gonna go to ctn there there was like i don't know like 10 occasions or so far that we showed that making off yeah and it's it's kind of fun and the, like you you get it's like teaching you know you get better at that presentation every time mm -hmm. and and so that's fun and at some point you sort of like also like i finished the movie in february so you also get detached from it and it's nice to come back together with the same people and just like reminisce about you know making it and you forget all the bad parts yeah it's like a family reunion <laughs> yeah exactly that's really cool, man. Uh, during during that whole process, you know, you, you get to share the making of. Um, you guys got to do the live crowd. Um, was there any cool like fan experience that you got to have? Like, was there because you just talked about these little girls that would come up and say, I, "I'm so glad I got to see myself on the screen," right? And you saw a lot of that uh, in Canto as well. A lot of folks came out and said, "Holy shit!" That's one thing that I lo absolutely loved about Encanto. And it's funny because, like I said, I work in a kitchen. So my my sous chef, the guy that I go to as far as like as far as chain of command goes, the guy I go to, his name is is Jose, right? But we call mm -hmm. we always call him Josie. I don't know why. I don't know how that name came up. But he's, he always just goes by Josie. And one thing that I noticed that he does is the same thing you see in Encanto. And for the life of me, what is um, what is the main act? Uh, what is the main character's name? Is it Isabel? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, they're under no, sorry, the no, no. it's uh uh it's not isabel that's her sister yeah I don't know. yeah her yes okay okay so so her we'll we'll, we'll circle back we'll, we'll, yeah. eventually it'll pop into her head um but uh what she does is she's under the bed and then she points with her lips she goes like that right, right. Yeah. and i i saw that and i'm like holy shit right so i i, I go to josie and i'm like hey man did you watch encanto yet he's like yeah i was like dude i saw her do what you do all the time and he's like what and I was like point with your lips and he was like yeah dude because he's uh he's half Puerto Rican and I believe he's half Mexican so Josie if I uh, if I get those those two mixed up I, I'm pretty sure that's what it is we've had many talks over this over the last couple of years working together um but he was like yeah that's like a, a whole like Hispanic thing is just pointing with your lips you don't point with your fingers you just point with your lips and I was like mm -hmm. dude seeing just seeing that little that little Mwah, right that that's what yeah. that felt like that felt like it was you know, like I said, I keep I hate going back to the same term, but I feel like a love letter to his to his culture, to his people and getting to see that. And then knowing that some little girl, some little boy, you know, maybe some adult saw that and like, oh, shit, mm -hmm. that is that is something uniquely us. I, there's something really cool about that. Um, did you get to hear? I know you alluded to it just a minute ago. See, you said little girls came up and said, hey, that was really cool. I got to see myself. But did you get to have any cool fan experiences of, around that kind of topic? um not the cvs i do not i mean it's it's nice if people are coming and saying they liked it and, and so on yeah um what i do get once in a while is uh um like young students from color it's coming and um and telling me or or like starting in their profession and telling me yeah i saw you're making like, like a book of Zootopia, you know and that yeah. really inspired me back then um so that that happens quite a lot and which is funny because you know like when i was making that i had no idea what i was doing i was like in my <laughs> attic in vancouver completely i had never worked for disney before i was just trying to i was like honestly i was like uh, close to tears every day because i didn't yeah. i did not know what they wanted and i tried my best you know and <laughs> I'm, i find drawing actually really difficult you know yeah it doesn't come easy to me now what so so i want to i want to stick on that topic for, again for just a second man so something that comes up quite often when I talk to people is what you just said. You know, I had Aaron Blaze on. I don't know if you know that name, but he was yeah. also a Disney guy, right? So he directed Brother Bear. And I was like, what was that like? Because you talk to him, you talk to Tony Bancroft, one half of the Bancroft brothers. Ladies and gentlemen, I had Tony on not too long ago. A amazing podcast, Bancroft Brothers Animation Podcast. Phenomenal. One of my favorite ones I listened to. But Tony was like, I think he said he was 26 or 27 when he directed Mulan. And I was like, dude, what was going through your head? And he's like, I'm so scared. Same thing with Aaron. He's like, I was nervous. Yeah. I didn't know what I was doing. That seems to be a common occurrence. It's just like, uh, I don't know what to do. You never say no. You always say yes and then just figure it out. Because if you say That's no, fine. they're going to go yeah. to somebody else, right? So when, <laughs> when, you're, when you're going through that, you said you were almost in tears almost every day. Um, what were some of the things that you would 
you see a little nugget. You're like, okay, I know I'm going in the right direction. At least I'm going to hold on to this. What were some of the things you would look for to kind of get you through those super desperate or maybe depressing times? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what were some of those things that would help motivate you to, to kind of keep progressing, not give up and keep going with Zootopia? What were some of those things you would lean on? Um, It's not like I didn't like working on it, um, but yeah, I was actually unrelated to this fighting with depression at that time too. Um, Mm -hmm. So I, I, went to therapy got some you know well butrin whatever that all yeah. helps so that that was unrelated to that and partly because that, that might be where the crying come from comes from but um i'm the part i really enjoy is coming up with um putting myself into the mind of an animal and how would i want to build my house or that sort of thing you know like that's or coming up with the logic of a world uh all that is comes easy to me and and that's just like the idea is just coming they keep coming you know the hard part is to drawing you know like draw a giraffe you know <laughs> that's where that's where i struggle and uh i i you know i've got some um you know like i, I look at uh drawings of the you know frank uh Stan, no frank and ollie for example or i have um i grew up with french um comic books when i was a kid so there's like uh, fun cars is a, a guy i really like and so i just have these books open you know to try to inspire me and get, get the feeling in there um but yeah so it's it's this mix between uh really enjoying all the ideas you know um and playing with the world yeah. and then having to put it on paper so it looks halfway good you know <laughs> um and and so in that in that realm it's actually kind of nice to be production designer at some point because you don't actually get to draw much anymore mm-hmm. but you get to uh to to it's nearly like like a teacher sort of thing like you you help everybody to to get, make it better you know and yeah. so it's i find it relatively easy to 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 critique other people's work and try to uh, point them in a direction that makes it better and so on um so i i don't have to do it all myself anymore <laughs> I got to imagine that feels pretty good though, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, but there, there, there's this, you know, there's, um, what do they call it? Uh, when this insecurity mm-hmm. about, about art, um, the imposter syndrome. Yes. Uh, I, I, I will never get rid of that. And I tell students that, you know, just get used to it. And I asked, uh, some people at Disney that I really admire that are geniuses and they, they have it too. So Absolutely. What man. are you going to do? <laughs> Just work through it, man. Cause it's, it's something that, it, like I said, especially that first year, um, I know we talked about the show before we hit record, but there was a show that came actually came out. I believe it came out of Vancouver. Um, Ed, Ed and Netty, right. Created by Danny Antonucci. Um, I had almost every writer, every artist, board artist. Um, you know, I had almost everybody from that entire cast and crew on. And the one commonality between all of them was imposter syndrome. Mm. And what I absolutely love. So in in my opinion, I go through it too, right? So what I do for a living, I cook for a living, right? What is cooking? Cooking is art. Cooking is a craft. Cooking is an art though. You get better at it so you can make, you have a blank palette. So same thing with you guys. You guys have, you know, a blank piece of paper that you are going to turn. That's your canvas. You're going to turn it into something beautiful. My plate is my canvas. I start out blank. Uh, what do I want to do? Oh, I want to mess with lamb. Oh, uh, you know, I, I've got this guy, Matthias coming on. He's German. So maybe I do some schnitzel, spetzel, you know, maybe I do something along those lines. Okay. Let, let's, let's play with flavors from Korea or, 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 or Russia or Italy or, or Spain, you know? So it, it's all of these things that influence you. Mm-hmm. And one thing that I've noticed, um, especially during COVID and I am completely secure in saying this. So once COVID happened and we got we got let go how we got let go from the place I'd spent 18 months at. Um, I was extremely jaded, right? I was extremely upset with how they let me go. They didn't come and talk to me face to face. They did it in a very cowardly way. Right. And then they told everybody that, you know, day shift essentially left, they found other jobs. So we have to close down for lunch. We can only do dinner service, which is absolute bullshit. Right. So I hear this and then, you know, I'm being told I'm we're all being brought back. Right. I go in there and it'd been three months since the COVID lockdown started. And, you know, I lived in Florida, so it was the wild, wild west out here. But, um, you know, there was no money coming in whatsoever. So May 23rd is my wife and I's anniversary. So for our anniversary dinner, we go into the restaurant that I thought I was coming back to. 
still didn't hear anything. If I come back, don't know, don't know, don't know. Trying to talk to the general manager. He doesn't want to talk to me. Find out the next day through a phone call when I said, I finally had enough. Hey, man, do you want, are we fucking coming back or not? Just tell me if no, then no. I just need to know, right? He's like, yeah, man, we're not bringing you back. I was like, all right, cool. You know, I'd already knew we weren't coming back because the the waiters had told me that story. I just told you, oh, you guys all found new jobs. Congratulations. Found that out on my fucking anniversary, right? Fine. So flash forward to me getting into the kitchen I'm in now. This is the best people I've ever worked for in my life. But it took me a year to realize that. I was extremely guarded, right? I was broken in a sense where I didn't have, I, when something's taken away from you, your your mm-hmm. livelihood, right? You don't know, like, do I want to do this again? Do I want to put my heart and soul into this when somebody else can tell me, hey, you're not going to do this anymore? I have no control over it. Somebody can just come and shut me down. So all of this going into it, then I start hearing that voice in the back of my head. You weren't really good anyways. Why fucking do this? You suck at this. Quit. Don't do it. You suck, right? All in my head, right? And then I start, that starts filtering over into my work life. Right. So then I start being super combative with the people that gave me a job, that gave me a chance after COVID. They didn't have to give me a chance. Florida is a right to work state. They don't have to give you a reason to get fired. You can fuck off, go away. You're done. Right. No, no issues. You know, and I was a real cunt for that first, I want to eight, nine months, right? All of the stress, all of this stuff, all of this voice in the back of my head. Right. And why am I telling you guys and Matias this? Why am I telling you guys this? Well, I got through that shit. Right. Everybody, no matter who you are, The highest of the highs, the lowest of the lows. You're always going to have that voice in the back of your head saying, you ain't shit. You suck. Do something else. But don't listen to that because your head will tell you shit that you think you want to hear. Your head's a bitch in the end of the day. Don't listen to it. Listen to what you think you should be doing. And I know that's convoluted and that's a weird way of saying, hey, man, you got to kind of get outside of your head. But you really got to just stay on track. Focus. Find something very, very small that you can enhance and then build yeah. from that, right? You can't go straight to building a house. You have to build the foundation, right? And that's what I had to do. I had to learn again that that voice that kept telling me I wasn't shit, that I didn't know what I was doing. You don't know how to fucking cook. You're dog shit. You just- yeah, I actually have a friend that that happened to. And yeah. um, it, I, thankfully, I it never happened to me. So, mm-hmm. But I, I know how it impacts uh, him. Yeah. And at, I'm sure cooking and drawing are similar in that way. Like he lost confidence, you know, yeah. and he's a fucking amazing, sorry, amazing artist. No, you're perfectly fine, man. <laughs> I think I've dropped fuck like four times already. So it's perfectly cool. Um, and uh, yeah, but, but, you know, when you don't have the confidence, then your art's not good either. And Absolutely. so it's really hard for him to get that back. Um, I have like nearly the opposite problem. Like I'm, because the series was a big success, you know, and it was the first Netflix animation movie. Now I'm like golden, you know, like, so now whatever I have to do has to be amazing, you know? So, um, that's another like pressure on itself. Sorry. That's another pressure on itself though. You come out of the exactly. Game. So you're, you're like, like I always, I'm trying to keep expectations so high that I can't meet them you know? <laughs> and just be, just always like, just be under expectation and then hopefully meet them anyway, that mm-hmm. sort of thing um but but it's yeah it's like you have to um every job you should be a little bit lost the the next job that means you're moving forward absolutely um and then just (laughs) yeah but i you know like i mean yeah i don't know it it would be hard for me to take the the story like that like you you went through because it's uh artists egos are brittle and we we need to be kind of confident to deliver Well, I I tell you one thing that really brought me out of it. And this is something that I think more folks need to do. You need to surround yourself with good people, not yes men, not yes women, not people that just tell you what you want to hear or what you think you want to hear. You need to tell, you need to surround yourself with people that are going to tell you when you're being an asshole, when you're being ridiculous, when you might just be seeing one side of a picture and you're kind of you got these blinders on if you ever seen a horse they've got these horse blinders on because if they look over to the side they're like oh that looks cool they're gonna go over there so they put these blinders on so it's only what's in front of them right and a lot of times with any kind of creative endeavor that's what we have we're so singularly focused right we're Mm -hmm. so focused on that goal that aspect whatever it is that we're chasing that carrot that's dangling in front of us we're not really going and noticing what's going on around us right we might just be fucking up tremendously but we're excelling in one little thing so we think we're on the right path and like i said one thing that really helped me get out of that maybe if your friend sees this or hears this maybe this might help um you know might help them um surround yourself with good people 
You know, mm. there's there's a way to do that where you're not, you know, sinking the ship. Essentially, there's a way where you can. I like that voice in the back of my head that tells me I ain't shit because I'm approved to that voice in the back of my head that tells me I ain't shit that I'm I'm d shit. Right. You know what I mean? It's it's a motivation. It, it, it's something to excel and and push the ball you know, further down the field. Um, so, like I said, maybe your friend will see this and maybe this will help them in their creative endeavor um, and get out of that funk that a lot of folks are still trying to climb out of. Um, if anything, if you learn anything from this podcast, ladies and gentlemen, it's just push through. There's so much greater things on the other side. Uh, you don't have to be sedentary. You don't have to be stationary. You don't have to be stagnant. That's what a lot yeah. of people have been dealing with, you know, and fail, you know, why not? I've learned more in failure than I ever have at crushing. Well, that's where, that's where you learn. Some failure. Yes, yeah, sure. absolutely. Um, you know, this and then is... if you're lucky, like you get a, a work environment where, um, you know, everybody respects everybody else and, and, and it's collaborative and, yeah. uh, and actually in animation, you get a lot of that. Like it's, you, the, you can't make a movie by yourself absolutely so, so everybody's dependent on everybody else and if you do it right then then you know like you you nobody's afraid of each other and new ideas come from all directions and then you just have to pick out the good ones you know and um but yeah no i i found animation kind of keeps you keeps you grounded because first of all you have to deliver so you you it's not like fine art or a, another I don't know. I'm, I'm not being fair to fine art, but you can't bullshit your way. <laughs> you can't bullshit your way anywhere in animation. Like you have to, you have to always deliver whatever if it's whatever job you have, you know. Um, and it's always a team. They're 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 reliant on you. So um, so you you end up having a lot of respect for everybody around you, and and they give give you respect too. And so it always it usually in my experience most of the time creates a really good environment yes. unless there's somebody at the top who is a prima donna or something like that <laughs> which and can that, happen but yeah. oh boy does it and that happens in all creative endeavors too there's always there's nothing worse than having that one person that's super cancerous because it can spread it's it's a cancer really oh, yeah it, yeah. It it, it really quick. Down. yeah absolutely man um you know, I've had a lot of fun with this chat. And, and like I said, this is why this podcast is called What's in My Head, because you never know. I never know where these kind of conversations are going to go. But I do know one thing. I would love to have you back on in a little while. My, my, my schedule yeah. is a little crazy, but I would love to have you back on. And maybe we can take, you know, two, two, two topics or two movies that you worked on. We can really dive deep into it, um, you know, but, but uh, before we hit before we start wrapping up, man, uh, Sea Beast, like I said, my family and I absolutely love this movie, right? We watched it, you know, when it dropped and then we watched it again later that weekend and the what the rewatchability, I don't know if that's really a word. I am horrible with the English language, uh, Matthias. Yeah, so, it's, it's important to me that word. Yeah, <laughs> I've I might have I'm, we might have contributed at least six to eight hours worth of that 19,000, you know, or what was it? 19,000 years, whatever it was. I mean, yeah, 19. Yeah, yeah. something like that. Something like some crazy fucking number, man. Uh, I'm pretty sure we contributed quite a bit to it. Um, but what I loved about this movie was the heart and soul, right? There was there was just something about it. It's it's very hard, in in, in my opinion, for you to latch onto something new as you get older, right? Because you 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 have these preconceived notions where you like, oh, you're you're set in your ways. You know what you like. You know what you don't like. You know. So when it comes to anything, whenever I am watching something. I'm the, both the best best fan and the worst fan because if I'm entertained, I don't care if anybody else doesn't like it. I like it, so I think it's great, and it's gotten me in so much trouble where somebody's like, "Oh, you know, did you see this movie?" I was like, "Yeah, it's fucking great." He's like, "Dude, you have horrible taste in movies because it wasn't good." I was yeah. like, "No, no, I I enjoyed it, right?" But but what I love about Sea Beast, man, was the fact that it sucked me in instantly. The colors, what you brought up just a little bit ago, you wanted them to, to see it in a certain color. Every pixel had to be right in this plot. I loved everything about this movie and it started with the colors. It was so bright. It was so beautiful. It sucks you in from go like she's reading the book to all these little kids and it's a story. And then you find out later that her parents, and then you find out spoiler alert, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't seen this movie yet, join in the other 19,000 hours um, or 19,000 years, excuse me. Um, but it's just like you, you see this whole story just evolve as it's going. And I'm just like, dude, this is so deep. This is so beautiful. This is so much more than I thought it was going to be. Cause you, you see a movie, you expect one thing. Like I told you in the beginning of the podcast, you expect one thing. 
And then we start peeling back those layers. You're like, fuck, this is deep. This is deep. Yeah. It's, it's That's partly why, why I, I made the scary jump from Disney to, to Netflix to work with Chris because he had this, you know, it wasn't just another funny comedy uh, mm-hmm. or, or like um, the pop culture references or anything like that. Like he really wanted to tell a story like a, an old fashioned action movie like Moby Dick, you know, where there's it's it's not you don't laugh all the time, you know, and it's it's partly it's kind of like really um deep and you every character has their has their you know your their scary under underbelly. <laughs> um it's it's interesting. And then the colors, I mean I am trying to balance the it's you know it's the whole movie is a balance like first of all i love that you felt uh what the first thing we we wanted to achieve is immersion mm-hmm. so um being sucked in is exactly what what we wanted to do yeah. and I, I chris is really good with um like at the end of every sequence you really want to know what happens next yes so that just keeps you going and even if the movie you know it gets compared to how to train your dragon which i think is a great movie you know not a bad yes. thing to be compared to but uh, it's not not everything in the movie is never done before, you know. Like it's uh, it has it's a genre. It's got elements of things that that have been done. But I don't care. Like if it's yeah. if you know if if it's still specific, it's that person and these two people that banter with each other, you know. And so you, it doesn't matter if if there's similarities to other things. Um, and then when it comes to style, we really try to. Um, have the the textures really you know um like rich and uh detailed and and believable the water effects that sony did are amazing oh my god are they so important um and and so everything is designed to sort of like suck you suck you in and there's like a there's a lot of and I think it's great. There's a lot of films that have that play with style now. Like it's you know maybe it started with um, the Spider Wars, but yes. uh, oh, that was like the big first big hit that that did that. Um, but we we deliberately didn't. Tr- I try to not do that in the CDs. Try to to make the world you know tactile and and real. And because there there was we didn't want to have a filter between the audience and and the inside of the movie. So really just just suck you in um yeah and then i i love the fact that chris refrained from pop culture references that the people are speaking kind of the lingo that you know you might believe yeah so they're not like often you end up and and non-americans are very you know um sensitive to that that you end up in a movie no matter where it is but it, actually it's just an american teenager you know like that that kid it doesn't matter if it's supposed to be colombian or whatever you know like um that happens really easily, and yes. I think Chris Chris really made an effort to make put the characters in into that time, um, and take all that seriously. And I think yeah, we just we just took everything so seriously. Like the ship is actually fully functional. Like mm-hmm. the um, and ropes are really hard to do uh, in in three D. It's like a technical issue. They they end up being like rubber bands very easily. You know, hard to control. Um, but we have like two thousand ropes on that ship. And we just, you know, they just had to figure it out. We have water everywhere, um, and yeah, everything's functional. Uh, the scale is is huge. Obviously, you know, like they're they're like riding on top of the CVs. They're in the nostril of the CVs, in the mouth, and all of that actually works. Like it's just the right size. You could do yeah. all that. And uh, there's a lot of things in there, like the um the, the baroque of the castle um that fits into the time but also um really reflects that uh dominating nature uh mm-hmm. aspect of baroque um so we we just took the time really seriously there's nothing in there that couldn't have been done in the time like there's even one i don't know if it's a spoiler but there is some kind of rocket in there mm-hmm. um, and it was supposed to be uh like a like a giant sort of like um crossbow um, but we tried to come up with something more interesting. And then our art director, Woon Young Young, uh, he's Korean, and he remembered having seen something in Korean history about a 1600 rocket launcher. Mm-hmm. So, so she found this old thing where, where they had this like, you know, like rockets uh, in, in the 16th century. Um, and so we, we kind of stepped from there and so on. So 
everybody just took everything really seriously you know that and because out of love you know and and like in the process that we you know you always say oh this scene needs a bit little bit more love which translates more time of somebody working on it mm -hmm. but it's also true it's like you know if everybody puts more love into it then the audience will get that out and then that that feels that touches the audience in some respect i guess absolutely does man and uh two things i wanted to talk about and then we'll uh we'll rotate into those two questions i gave you um like i said earlier i'm a navy guy right so i spent about seven and a half years in the military mm -hmm. um and i absolutely love it took me a long time to appreciate and it's not like i don't appreciate my time in uh, time in the military. It always sounds like you're in prison. Whenever you talk about military, it's like, yeah, I did seven and a half years. It's like, yeah, 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 me too. Um, but uh, I didn't appreciate, and I still don't think I appreciate my time because it was a very rough time. First four years, uh, I was pretty much gone all the time, deployed. You know, I missed the first four years of my son's life, uh, oh, my oldest hard. son, you know, so it was, I had a negative way of looking at it. Um, but you know, for all the negatives that happened with me, it, you know, I was able to buy my house at 19 years old, right? Nobody in my family has Nobody. been to college, right? <laughs> Nobody in my family had had their house at 19, you know, so it, it definitely set me a lot further ahead than, than most people, especially in my eight, like going into my high school, there's a few people that kind of, that went to high school with me that listen to this. So don't take this the wrong way, but there's a lot of losers, man. There was a lot of people that just didn't give a shit, man. They had no, they had no ambition. They didn't want to do anything. They want to stay at home with mom. They wanted to fucking, you know, do the same thing, party every weekend. And 10 years later, you're seeing that. And so what I, what it took me a long time to understand and appreciate um, the whole Navy thing. And then I see this movie, Sea Beast. And one thing I absolutely appreciate, and I would have not gotten this if I wouldn't join the military, but the lingo. You talked about that just a second ago. I loved hearing Port and Starboard. I loved hearing, you know, Bow and Stern. I loved hearing the nautical terms that I had to absorb and I had to know everything. Bulkheads. You know, it was just so, it was a flashback in a good and bad way. Cause I was like, oh fuck, I remember where I was at when I had to use that word for the first time. Right. You know, and then seeing stuff like that. And there was two scenes and you brought up one of them. Uh, one of them that I absolutely loved, and I thought it was it was probably my favorite scene as far as like funny goes, was them hanging out of uh, of Red's nostril, and then mm. them just looking like a booger in the wind, right, just swinging back and forth. I, I thought that was funny as I don't know why it was probably because I was two joints in in the movie, so I'm just I'm happy as fuck yeah. because the weed the weed right. I'm like oh man, this is great, All right? So I just thought that was funny, but the the other scene. And for the life of me, I apologize, Matisse. I, I'm blanking on the uh, his name. The um, the Jacob, main. Um, I mean, thank you, thank you. I, I don't. I knew it was a J. I was like, no, it's not. It's not. No, and yeah, it was. Um, but uh, the scene where I think, like, hit the hit the hardest for me, and I, I don't. I I still don't understand why. Maybe it was because he understood it was the same thing when she found out her parents were a part of killing killing these cbs you know just right. out of spite right so it was the scene where he's walking on red and then it was after she spent all day trying to pull the uh the harpoons out mm -hmm. and then he sees this and then he starts to like question like am i in the right here am i wrong like, right. what's going on and then at the end of that that sequence he's pulling the last little bit of the harpoons out of red. And, and, and like I said, I don't know what it is about that scene is so fucking powerful for me. Like I see that and I'm just like, he just did a complete 180. Like he's still on the fence about these things, but he noticed, or he realizes, at least for me looking at it, you might feel differently because you, you helped create this movie and you might have a different aspect, but he noticed that he was not a hundred percent clean in this matter. Like he definitely did some shit that was dark and, you know, whether it's you attack them and they're doing out of retaliation, who's really right. Yeah. Right. Like who, 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 who's, you know, they always say, um, that, uh, you know, an eye for eye makes the whole world blind. Right. It's, it's a very powerful. Yeah, that's, that's kind of a theme of the movie really. Yeah exactly you know and it just there like i said i don't know what it was about that scene maybe you might be able to break it down a little bit for me and maybe be able to understand how i'm taking it but it's just there's something so powerful about that scene yeah um something i i don't think anybody said everywhere else and i don't know if it's okay but i'm just gonna say it now um part when chris you know like some late evening conversation talking about where he got the idea from um 
I think partly what inspired the movie was the Iraq war, like yeah. uh, to to um, you know it was it was uh, started under under you know questionable intelligence and, and motivation, yep. false pretenses, yeah, and um, and you know the people in the army, I'm sure, try to do what they have to do and follow orders and and you know our heroes if they can um but you know the the the, the whole mission might be wrong you know so mm -hmm. so the theme of the movie is like you can you know you can be a hero but you can still be wrong like it doesn't negate you being a hero just because so it's that and and you know like um i mean being german you know having having the nazi history and and seeing the last i don't know years in america you know i'm very sensitive to to propaganda that yes. kind of um really it's like the them or us sort of thing yes. you, you know it's that's, othering yeah it's, it's other playbook that's been very old and you know in germany we know that book already you know <laughs> um and uh and so this movie is like is is trying to what i like about it is like he never wanted to portray the beasts as you know, are they really just cute? You know, they just want to be our friends. Like they still killed, you know, like they, yeah. that's just what they do. It was just about, you have to break that. First of all, you have to question um, the, 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 the motive um, without having to degrade the people who had, you know, the, the, who were in the army, basically, you know, um, it's not, it's not their fault, you know? Yeah. And the second thing is um, you have to break the cycle of violence like somebody's got it otherwise it like revenge just keeps going and and will create revenge again so color wise for example in the movie there's this um in the beginning you have this green monster fighting the red ship and there is a lot of uh, the royals have a green green white gold color scheme and cb is this bright red and there's this like uh uh, red versus green, us versus them uh, theme going on uh, for a long time in the movie. And then Maisie sort of like brings, uh, she she gets like some yellow beasts. She's got the blue beast. She got the red beast. And she kind of brings all those colors together. And so that's like a little color theme. Yeah. <laughs> um, how, how they can actually coexist in the end. Um, and I don't even know if they coexist in the end. It just in the end, it just says, and we didn't go into their territory, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's the solution, but. But the, the the other thing is that Chris really didn't want uh didn't want it clean either you know like it's not like oh the world is saved in the end um yeah. who knows you know I like ending everything's complicated it absolutely is and I love endings like that where it makes you question like man I wonder I wonder how they are ten years from now I wonder right. if what's going to go on I wonder if if this was the catalyst to a better life for everybody you know obviously we're gonna have peaks and valleys with anything right we're gonna have good days we're gonna have bad days but i wonder man are they working together now are they back at odds you know it, it's it's people have a very very short-term memory uh and fear is a huge and I, i'm i'm so glad you, you know you brought up uh what you brought up you know with the iraqi war you know obviously with germany and 19 you're never supposed to say this um but my favorite, my favorite war was World War II. And the reason I say that is because I love reading about it. I love learning. Like I was in the Navy, December 7, 1941, we get brought in the war with the bombing of Pearl Harbor, right? It, I, I was in Pearl Harbor when it, not when it happened, but you know, I, I went to Pearl Harbor. It was one of my first places I went as far as um, a, uh, fuck, I can't think of the name now. Um, just going in, it was the first port, uh, port visit we had when I mm -hmm. it first time, you know, so going over the burial grounds where those men died that day is eerie standing on the outside of a ship in full dress uniform, saluting people that passed away going on what this is the 60, 80, this is the 81st anniversary. Yeah. 81st anniversary, 1941. So this year is the 81st anniversary of Pearl Harbor. It's fucking insane. Right. You know, so I love, like I said, I, I love learning about this stuff. And, and I love the fact that he brought in real life experiences and didn't do what is so easy to do. And that's villainize the people right. yeah, yeah. that are just following orders regardless. Yes. You sometimes people know shit is, is wrong and they try yeah. to do what's right. And then you see people that are ostracized for doing what's right 
in uh-huh. a, a situation. So it's, it's one of those things. It's like, man, I, I, I see what they're doing here. And, and I, I, like I said, it was, it would have been so easy if Chris would have went, went and was like, yeah, we're just going to make the people, they're the bad guys, or we're going to make the CBs. Right. They're the bad guys. It's a lot harder to take something that is very delicate, like that situation you just brought up and make it seem like not just one person's to blame. Everybody has some kind of a fault, if that makes any sense. I'm boiling something so beautiful down to something so dumb. Coming no, 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 that's exactly what it's about. Chris, be so happy. <laughs> yeah, you know, so I, like I said, it was just this movie is so much more than... Yeah, and I mean, you're talking about Pearl Harbor. I'm like, you know, in Germany, we obviously learn the history of the war from the other side. Yes. Um, Which, thankfully, it's... It's, you know, like it's many years in school that you go through this. And so um, it's important, I think, you know, to 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 work through the wars and the, the, the wrongdoings of your country and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so it's harder to be patriotic after that. Um, yeah. And it's hard to 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 see things simple and black and white after that, because um, there's a lot of gray. There is there's victims everywhere, you know, yes. Um, so yeah, that was really interesting. It was fascinating. It really is, and 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 I definitely I told you we wouldn't get uh, you know political or anything like that. But uh, yeah. off off no no that's perfectly fine. I th- like like I said I'll talk anything with anybody. Just know that you know I I I always find it very interesting when anything like a hot button topic like like what we were just talking about or you know race religion um, you know gender anything like that. I absolutely love talking about all that stuff. However, people sometimes they have an agenda to push or they have things that they have to say, or they have things that they're parroting that they heard somebody else say. Very rarely do people listen. Very rarely do people converse, right? It's usually I'm going to talk at Matthias. He's going to talk at me. Nobody's listening, right? So that's why I try to stay, stay away from those hot button topics because regardless of how we, we discuss it, somebody's going to hear one little clip. Somebody's going to hear one little thing. They're going to take it either out of context or they're not going to hear everything. They're just going to hear that one button topic, that one, that one phrase that's just going to start a fire. And then all you have to do is try to put out fires. Like, no, no, you didn't listen to what I'm saying. You're just hearing what you want to hear. Right. You know, so I, I guess I love talking hot, hot button topics. And I'm one of those people that don't try to push anything on anybody. I want to hear your side. I want you to hear my side, but I'm not going to sit here and change, change anybody's mind. I'm not going to change anybody's life. You know, I think what I think because of everything that's happened to me my entire life, I have this perspective. I have this experience of 33 years of life, right? You know, regardless of what I've done, what I haven't done, you know, I've got some experience out there and how I see the world is kind of how uh, I've been shaped and molded since I was a little kid, right? You know, what I've read, what I've seen on TV, the documentaries I've done, or, you know, people I've talked to, right? I I have such a profound experience when I get to talk to folks like you, um, because I get to look just for, you know, we've been talking for like an hour and a half. I get to hear and see what Matthias thinks or how he thinks or how he's looking at a scene. And then we start talking about real world experience. Like, 19, like 1941 Germany, I can imagine, was fucking terrifying. 1941 sure, yeah, sure. America was fucking terrifying because we're at war and now we're on the brink. I really hope fucking cooler heads prevail and we do not go the nuclear route because it, it is terrifying to think that we're a bad day away from everything being a race that we've come from all of the, regardless of what you think of where we're at as a society, it is so much better than it was in 1941. Oh yeah. Yeah. So no, if you have children, you can't even go there in your mind. Absolutely. You know, I, I want, I want a world that's left for my kids and your kids and their kids and his kids and her kids. I want a good world left behind for all of these people. Cause I've had a good life. I've had a great life. I've had a really blessed life compared to a lot of people that I know and how they've grown up and how I've, I've heard their stories, you know? So like I said, anytime I get to talk and people are receptive and people just aren't trying to push whatever it is they feel. And they tell you you're dumb because you don't think like them. No, fuck you, man. There's no reason that we should think alike because we're two different people. You grew up in a, in a country that I've never been to that I've always wanted to go to. I love you guys' food. I, I don't drink. But I would love to go over there during Oktoberfest and see what it's all about. I fucking love people's culture. I love there's something so special about sharing a plate with somebody, plate of food with somebody. That's that in my opinion, you can completely tell what a person's like just by sharing a plate with somebody. I don't give a fuck what anybody says. You can you can 100 percent know where that person's coming from just by you bringing your favorite dish that your mother made or your grandmother made. And I'm giving you my favorite dish that my grandmother made. There's something special about that. There's something human about that. There's something primal about that. You know, so like I said, 
long-winded way of saying that I, I love topics like this, but people yeah. I don't think a lot of people are ready for it. You know, I don't think a lot of people really want to listen and really want to work shit out. They just want to fucking yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm amazed, you know, like with with our history as as Germans, um, that I'm so welcome in mm -hmm. the world, you know, like you know, generations change things, you know. Yeah. Like my parents were were babies, mm -hmm. um, just in the war and right after the war. They're traumatized in their own way yeah um but i i remember like sitting um i was i think it was in space gems uh next to somebody from iran um then me a korean american you know like i would name it italian whatever yeah. you like all the countries that used to be maybe at war or not you know and and no not anymore and and so things things are developing in a good direction sometimes you know and and things that seem like a like a conundrum or quagmire that doesn't you can't solve you know just give it the next generation they'll solve they're they're you know they're, they'll move on they'll be cooler than us <laughs> <laughs> my son tells me all the time that i'm not fucking cool and i look and i'm like dude shut up i'm cooler than you <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, but, hey. yeah it, it really is man uh well like i said matthias i've really enjoyed this conversation i don't know if when you when you accepted to come on the podcast if you thought we were going to talk about what we talked no, about i did not expect that no uh well i'm i'm, I'm glad like i said I'm, I'm always glad when i can have folks come on and i'm always glad when they're like you they're fun as fuck to talk to i, I i've had so many great conversations i've got like 130 episodes 140 episodes whatever it is i've recorded i've only released 105 because you know we record so many just in case something happens mm -hmm. um like what happened when we when we were talking before we hit record um you know so it, it's it's not like i said it's nice getting to hear your perspective on life getting to see a little glimpse of what matthias does or thinks or does or, you know do, does or thinks and then he gets to put that in his artwork or where he came from or what he's experienced or what his family's experienced, you know, growing up in a crazy time, you know? So like I said, I always appreciate these conversations. So like I said, thank you again for coming on. Yeah, um, uh, so those two questions that I gave you, man, you know, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll talk about I have them. time to think about them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, boy, oh boy, which one do you want to start with okay. first? You want to start with your Mount Rushmore? Or do you want to start with some books? Sure. Let's do Mount Rushmore. But um well, there's different different versions of Mount Rushmore I can see. One um, uh, would definitely be a, a, a long pair, like a like a panorama around Mount Rushmore with the nine old men in it. <laughs> Beautiful. Which one was your favorite of the nine old men? I always like hearing this whenever we, I get a somebody. Like Johnson, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And Frank Thomas, both of those. They're like, they're the ultimate for me. Um, and then otherwise, uh, you know, like there's there's like uh, role models that you pick up uh, during your life, like uh, that you try to to emulate. Like there was a a, a supervisor that I had very early uh, called Bernie Denk, who who um, who was the reason I went to Montreal and met my wife because he was there, and I thought, yeah, I'll meet him again. You know, very cool guy in animation. Uh, then Dave Getz, the production designer, that got me to Disney. Um, then Chris, that got me to Netflix. You know, there's just I don't know. It's still so many cool guys in, in this business. It's uh, it's going to be a, a group photo of Mount Rushmore. <laughs> it's perfectly fine, man. Uh, like I, said, I always like hearing the uh, the favorite of the nine old men because it's, it's you know, for the most part, it's always different. This has uh, always been my guy. I've always been. Yeah. Mark date. There is just something like getting to read into this book. Uh, there's a few books that have that have really changed um, my life when it comes to animation. You know, when I started this podcast, I, I had a guy by the name of Fred Cyber. You know, Fred Cyber came on and he started the Cartoon Network Shorts. What a cartoon! That whole animation renaissance for Cartoon Network when they first started going. You know, and he he told me to pick up this book uh, that that's right here, and this completely changed my outlook on what animation is and what animation could be. And it was I don't know if you've ever read this one, but uh, of mice of Ma uh, mice and magic. Yeah. Uh, this book, like whenever I buy a new animation book and my wife's like, you're buying another one. I was like, look, you need to go blame, blame Fred because he told me to buy this one. And it's just been a learning experience ever since then. So anytime a new one comes up, but just getting to hear like who was important to you guys, as far as the Disney world goes, it's always interesting because then I start to go like, okay, if you liked Frank and Ollie, I'm going to go look at Matthias's work a little bit deeper and see if I can get any kind of uh, any kind of nod or like maybe maybe he took you know a little bit of that inspiration from Ollie in this one or maybe he took it from Frank in this one or maybe he did Mark maybe he did Will maybe he did this one you know I, I like seeing if I can pick out like who influenced you guys so I really enjoy that um, so that second question uh, two books that you think every fan of animation or anybody in animation should have on their shelves 
I don't know if um that that's I'm just gonna get one up here. Yeah. So I don't know if it's um uh, it's not about animation. I would say the usual, you know, like the um illusion of life mm -hmm. was obviously the first one that I saw and was, you know, through my mind and all that. I really like this guy here. Um he's he's called Andre Franca and he's uh he's a comic book artist from Belgium and he's got this amazing line oh, wow yeah he, he's awesome and uh i grew up with this guy and um there's a lot of a lot of his stuff in my work a lot how do you spell his last name so i can look him up it's f-r-a-n-q-u-i-n thank you and uh another one is uh from a friend of mine called uh manarenas mm -hmm. Uh, it's called Jackson the Fawn, and it's uh, it's just beautiful. It's just like these amazing watercolors. So they're not specifically animation. They're just books that inspire me and that I try to, like it's these, uh, it's like a graphic novel. Oh, that's beautiful. All watercolor. Um, yeah. So these are books I, I just love very much. Yeah. That's really cool, man. I'm a, do you read comics still? Uh, I do, yeah. But, but you know. Not not as much as I would like to do. Another one I really love is this one here, um, the arrival from uh, Sean Tan. Sean Tan. Um, so that's that's what what I love about this is like a, there's no text in it and mm. it's an immigrant story. Yeah, so it's like it's like wow, very, that is beautiful. Yeah, going to this new world and it's very hard to describe. It's very imaginative yeah. and uh, and without words, like a silent movie, but it's amazing. Yeah. So it's called the arrival. I got that one written down. I'm gonna buy that one as soon as I get off this call because that was that that picture of I don't know if it was a castle or if it was a city, but that was beautiful. Yeah, that amazing. One opened up to yeah. Um, well, like I said, Matthias, this has been a lot of fun. Yeah, it's been uh, fun too. I never know where the conversations are gonna go, uh, but I'm glad it went where it went, man, because I got to learn a lot more, not just about you know what you did on on CBS, but you know how you think and, and you know how you kind of moved through the animation world. Um, for the fans that might not know, where can they go to find you if they say, hey, I really loved what you worked on, uh, your social media handles, essentially? Um, the best is my website. Um, it's MatthiasLechner.com. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a contact page there, too, if you want to write. I'll, I'll, I'll read that generally. Okay. Uh, other than that, I'm I'm on Facebook somewhere. I think it's at work Matthias. Uh, sorry, not uh, on, on um, Instagram, at work Matthias, I think. But I'm not really a very big social media person like that's i did that for a little bit after the cbs came out to push it but now i kind of delete it again so uh, that's a good thing because it, it has the tendency to be kind of rough um and and the link for your uh, website will be in the description so all they have to do is click on it and it'll go straight to your page that way they don't have to sit there and type anything because if i've learned anything about people people want it now and they want it quickly oh, click yeah. the link and go yeah. absolutely man netflix has done that where they're like you know what we're gonna we're gonna precondition and train people we're going to drop an entire season and you got to wait a whole year. Uh, but like I said, man, this has been a lot of fun. I can't wait to do this again. Uh, he's been Matthias. I've been Julian. It's been a What's My Head podcast. And it's been another piece of your childhood. Good night. Good night. My guest next week is the man, the myth, the legendary animator himself, Mr. Ron Husband. Enjoy the teaser. Yeah. Okay. He's, he's a giant. Absolutely. Uh, I have an opportunity to, uh, to room with him. Uh, uh, coming down as a, as a tree and, and just sort of seeing or, or seeing how Glenn approaches the scene and how uh, meticulous uh, he is in his drawing, his um, his thumbnailing, uh, the thought process, and all the, the things that he had uh, absorbed from from Ali, and um, and you know it's, it's just always thinking about. Um, um, putting personality into um, his characters and just passing passing on that wisdom. Now, I said we we uh, we roomed together and we had two small rooms. You know, at, at the end of a hallway, you open the door and you go into Glenn's room. And then you had to go to to another door and open the door, and that was my room. So, so we were just literally uh, I had to pass him to get to my room and pass him to, to leave or. Uh, but uh, but seeing him, 
you know, his worth at work ethic. You know, he come from a great family. His dad, you know, Bill Keane, uh, doing the comic strip, and, and then had been you know brought up around art and all that kind. Of, and but but again, just to see him uh, uh, flourish and how he approached the scene, uh, um, which which I was able to glean from and try to emulate some of the things that he was doing. I remember uh, when he was doing the um, the scene of um, uh, the bear fight in in in, uh, in Fox and the Hound, and he's 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 in in in, in preparation for all that. You know, he's reading all these books about uh, um, bear attacks. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I'm I'm walk, I'm coming to work one morning. And he says, "This is hot, it's hot." You know, listen to this. He starts reading from this this National Geographic or something about this this bear attacking this. Person and you know and all this graphic stuff is going, but 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 he brought all that to life when he did the uh, copper fighting the bear, you know, and, and bringing all that stuff. And so I said, wow, you know, and so leaning from how uh, he would approach a scene and and really immerse himself in that and and, and get all the um, information and all this, and then search your, search your thumbnails and then you know bring all that emotion into into the big screen uh, mm -hmm. and into his animation. Very passionate animation. Very passionate person. You know, loving person. You know, he, he's my brother. I love Glenn. Uh, you know, forever. But uh, but yeah.